Thank you, everyone. Yeah, so my name is Miguel Angel Fernandez. I work for Vitergia. I'm a consultant, analytics specialist. Um, I've been five years now working at Vitergia. Um, really honored to be here, really happy to be here uh, with all of you. Um, today I'm presenting about uh, something that can happen in our software projects and communities. We are here to talk about communities. So we talk about false communities and, well, communities are made up of people and those communities, we know that uh, they rely on different tools and platforms to cover different aspects of, of the projects, right? Um, you can have platforms and tool to, tools to manage code and also to track issues, changes like pull requests, merge requests, et cetera, right? Um, things like uh, questions and answers in platforms like Stack Overflow, uh, messaging applications like Mattermost, these kind of uh, platforms, right? So uh, the communities are using these tools to, um, to support the, their work on their, their projects, right? Okay. Um, so we can have one or many community members, usually with a management role, but uh, could not, uh, willing to learn more about the community you know, and the projects uh, the community is involved with, right? Um, so the, uh, a basic question could be, okay, what's going on in my, in my software project, you know? This is a fairly basic question. And this question can raise other questions, like how many people are contributing to my projects, okay? And also, how many contributors, how many contributions were submitted, uh, were submitted during the last year? So these may seem simple questions, but they are not, because they entail many different details that you have to be taken into account to properly answer these questions, right? Um, and here we are, I'm talking about Remote Lab, which is the tool uh, from the Chaos project. Uh, Viterja is the main maintainer for this project. Uh, it's an, op an open, free open source uh, platform to analyze uh, FOSS projects and communities. And I'm going to explain a bit how it works because this is helping us to understand how to answer the questions I just said, okay? So, uh, as I was saying, open source communities are using many different tools, and what this Remote Lab platform is doing is talking with different platforms, different APIs, and get data from all of them, okay? It gets the data in a standardized way, and then what we do is to build an identities database, and we will see in a moment why this is important. Okay, so we get the raw data from the sources we are analyzing, then we build an identity database, and what we do is to produce an augmented set of data, which is the enriched data. It's the data from the sources plus the identity information plus other um, data messaging we can, do, we can do to ease the later analysis of the projects, okay? And with this enriched data, we can produce dashboards, we can produce reports, and we can extract metrics from the projects, from the different tools that are using, okay? Okay, next. So imagine that um, we are going to analyze one of the projects and see what's going on and try to answer those basic questions like how many people is contributing, how many contributions there are, you know? So I'm taking one example, which is the Wikimedia uh, uh, Wikimedia projects, okay? So uh, Wikimedia has this Wikimedia tech dashboard. They are using a running remote lab instance to analyze uh, their projects, okay? I'm going to show you a couple of examples and about a couple of visualizations uh, showing some data from Wikimedia projects, okay? So this is showing the number of active contributors, okay? Uh, sending commits, in this case, I'm focusing only on code contributions and commits, but we could measure other things from other tools like issues, pull requests, uh, how much time does it take to close things. So we can measure a lot of things. Now we are focusing on people sending commits, in this case for each month, so each of these bars represent one month. And um, this is the number of active contributors during the last 10 years. Okay, so you see uh, we have numbers there. And also, we can have uh, for the number of contributions, 
the number of git commits uh, submitted during the last during this period I, I've mentioned for the Wikimedia projects, right? So these are fairly basic metrics, and probably this is not telling you anything. Uh, you will need to have your set of goals that you want to pursue for your project, then you should ask yourself the questions for answering those goals, and then you can have a set of metrics that help you to answer those questions, right? Okay, well, so we use a uh, remote lab to analyze the community, and now what? We have to read the data. And one of the questions we can make to ourselves is, okay, let's see which are, who are our top contributors, okay? So we need to wear our de uh, data scientist hats for a moment and dive into the data. So we are going to represent in a table each uh, author, each contributor, and the number of commits that person is producing, and the number of unique repositories that person participated to. Okay, so we have this table. Um, we see unique identifiers for the authors, you know, privacy things and so on. Um, and the question would be, okay, let's wear our hats. And we see that the first three rows, the number of commits seem different from the fourth row. So, well, this is something to, uh, at least to have a look at. This is something remarkable about the top three contributors, right? Um, let's reveal the names a bit only for the three, for the first three. So, well, those are really huge numbers. Uh, if you have a close look at the name of the authors, they don't look really human. <laughs> okay. Um, so it seems like our top contributors are not human. Okay. They don't seem human at least. So the next question is, um, how well do you know your community? Because this is key if you want to analyze your projects and you want to understand your community. You need to, to know your community, basically. And to answer the question, uh, you, you can ask yourself uh, questions like, okay, who's composing, who's composing my community, right? Okay, we know communities are made up of people. Yes, it's true. But we have seen that not only. So there could be bots too. This should be taken into account, okay, for our analysis. Um, okay, so we are talking about bots, but maybe we need a common definition for what, a, uh, what is a bot, right? So um, let's say that bots are usually associated with bad things, bad intentions, like cheating and these kind of things, but in, in false projects are commonly used for good. So. Um, commonly used for you for good. So yeah, we, we will define a bot as a program which is designed to interact similar uh, to a, how a person would to other programs and services, okay? And as I was mentioning in false projects, bots are used to automate tedious tasks. So the work we, we don't want to do is repetitive tasks, uh, a lot of work. Okay, we, let's set an automatic account that does the work for us. And that's it, right? But the thing is that those accounts are submitting contributions to the projects, okay, too. Um, I asked you before how well you know your community, and also this means you have to, to know your community members a bit. Uh, so you can see uh, things like, okay, I'm presenting a community member here. Um, his name is Tom Riddle, and he's studying in Hogwarts. Uh, so Hogwarts, uh, yeah, it's a magic school at Hogwarts. Um, and also I'm, present, I'm introducing to you another community member. Uh, this one, this guy here, his name is Lord Voldemort. And he's a freelance wizard. Okay. Okay. Um, and now I have a question for you. How many of you um, are familiar with Harry Potter characters and story? Okay, so most of you, but not all of you. So let's make an analogy between the people in the room who raised her hand, uh, her hand because uh, people knowing Harry Potter story and characters have context about, about these characters. And people not knowing Harry Potter is like someone coming new to the community and not knowing the community at all, okay? So people knowing this context and 
knowing this story, know that they are the same person. Okay, spoiler, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so they are the same person. Um, but if we don't have this context, we may take these two people as different contributors for our projects, right? Um, well, reality, of course, is more complex. So this was just an example. So imagine we have one of our contributors, uh, C, uh, is Jane Doe. So Jane Doe is contributing to the project in many different tools with different accounts. So for instance, uh, she's submitting code with different email accounts. She's using, she's using a Gmail account, a corporate account for Vitergia, another GitLab account. So she has uh, contributed with many different accounts. Also, she has an account on GitHub. And she's sending email to emails to many different mailing lists for our project with different email accounts as before. And she's also active in, in Slack with another username. Okay. And also we can have some more information about this contributor. In this case, uh, where this person where this person worked for, uh, which organizations, and we have some end start and end dates. So the thing is we need to track all these different profiles from a given contributor in our community, okay? We need to, to say, okay, all these profiles, all these identities belong to the same person. They are not separate people, okay? Otherwise, we will not be counting contributions properly in our project, okay? Okay, so we said a lot of problems, <laughs> and now I think it's time for some solutions. Um, well, I told you before about Grimoire Lab, and Grimoire Lab, um, is this platform of tools to analyze the, the code. And I was saying we are building an identities database. And the component behind that is a tool which is called Sorting Hat. Okay? So this, this tool is managing all this profile information and allows you to uh, perform operations like, okay, we have different profiles. We know they belong to the same person. We can say, okay, let's merge those profiles into one single identity. Right? We can, we can say that. Also, we can add this extra information as the organization. I was, I was mentioning before, hey, this person worked for each organization from this time to this time. So we can add that information too. And also, we can complete the profile with some extra info, like the name you want to display, and primary email, and so on. OK? This is, of course, for people willing to uh, manage the project and get uh, metrics from, from the projects. OK, and the important thing is also Sorting Hat is allowing you to mark profiles as bots. OK, so um, this way we can say which individuals in our community are coming from automatic accounts. And then we can use this information. This information gets updated into the enriched data. So then we can filter in or out the information we have for each profiles, okay? For each of the profiles. Okay, I'm going back to the data we have explored at the beginning. And this is the amount of contributors, so people, number of active contribution, contributors, sorry, um, sending commits during the last 10 years. But now I'm going to represent the proportion of humans and bots in this graph, okay? so. Each bar is going to be split in two parts. Okay. So in blue you see the number of humans. And I don't I don't know if you see that, but in the tip of each bar, it's like a tiny, tiny <laughs> bit of orange. Uh, those are bots. Those are bot accounts. And you can say, okay, there are not so many of them. It's not relevant. So well, it doesn't matter that we can we need to identify these automatic accounts. It is a lot of work. But for instance, if you take the other graph showing the number of commits, and we make this uh, partition of the data, what you will see is fairly different. It turns out that a huge portion of the activity is not coming from human contributions. So in blue are the contributions made by humans. Uh, in orange, contributions made by bot accounts. OK, so look at this. I mean, if you don't identify properly the bot accounts in your communities and you are looking for metrics, you can have really inaccurate numbers. So um, this way, we can 
mark profiles as bots. We can filter their, them in or out. We can split the information so you get more accurate numbers when analyzing your communities. Okay. All right. Um, now I would love to uh, talk to you a bit about the future. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about an ongoing research we are uh, having, which is it would be great if we can uh, send a question like maybe uh, have kind of an automatic process to label these bot accounts. Because nowadays, this process, I mean, you can do that with shorting hat, but it's a manual process. So if someone needs to review all the different accounts, all the different profiles, and uh, this is a lot of work. You have to manually review that. You have to manually mark this. Uh, and in communities like Wikimedia, you can have thousands of people contributing to the project. So this can get really, really difficult. In the case of Wikimedia folks, they are doing uh, really great. They have great documentation. I, uh, I'll share with you some links uh, afterwards. Um, you can see that they have amazing documentation and they have all the bot accounts properly identified and so on. Uh, but the idea, the research idea is, OK, let's try to produce um, a machine learning model uh, that reviews all this profile information and give us an idea of which automatic accounts can, uh, sorry, which accounts can be uh, automatic accounts and which ones are hum from humans, OK? So the ideal thing would be have something like tell, tell us, hey, this looks like a bot. And sorting hat will say, hey, OK, copy that. I take note of that. Um, we are facing many challenges, OK? Uh, first, it's a highly imbalanced classification problem. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with uh, data science processes, but if you remember the uh, slide where we show the amount of contributors that were human and the amount of contributions that were bots, uh, if you go with that information to a classification model, okay, the classification model, it will tell you that the profile is a human, always, because you don't need to know anything, because the probability of being a bot is so low, you are not, you are not going to, to have a look at anything. It's like having a, an strange disease, right? I'm not a doctor, but the possibility that you have an strange disease is so low, I'm going to say you are healthy, and probably I'm not going to be mistaken, right? So uh, this problem needs to be addressed, uh, applying some techniques that are um, helping to uh, leverage this, this imbalance uh, problem, OK? Um, of course, we have more challenges. It depends on the data source, because bots have really defined tasks. So it's not the same if we analyze commits, if we analyze uh, GitHub issues, if we analyze uh, pull requests or comments, or maybe questions and answers. So the data sources are different. So it depends on the data source. But also, what about the community? Because we are analyzing software communities, and each community has their own way of working. Uh, they have their own needs, so they have developed tools. Some tools are uh, way, are fairly common. Like uh, if you are GitHub users, probably you have seen uh, accounts like Dependabot, uh, who uh, warns you about uh, un uh, outdated dependencies and this kind of thing. So you can expect some accounts, depending on the source, to be consistent, but others may not may may not be. Uh, consistent, so it's also dependent of uh, the community. So if we produce a model, this would mean that we need to adapt its model for not only for the data source we are analyzing, but for the community we are going to analyze. Okay, and also we are facing um, this set of data that um, change over time, basically. So. Uh, also, uh, uh, a good research question is how to deal with that, because the information is not, um, is not fixed. Is, uh, it is changing over time. So this may, the behavior could change, right? Also, uh, we have seen some cases where we analyze these um, accounts, and we, we have seen cyborgs. 
And this is, <laughs> let me explain. So these are humans. I'm producing human stuff. But sometimes they have uh, made a script for automating something. Uh, and so they have both human and both bot behavior. So the classifier in these cases is like, I'm not, I'm not sure what to do. This is a cyborg. This is like a messed up thing. OK. Uh, OK, so things we are using uh, to solve um, this uh, these problems, apart from the imbalance uh, problems and so on. We are using the profile information we have from Sorting Hat and all the different identities I mentioned before. We are applying also, we have the domain knowledge, we have expertise, uh, we have experience working with communities. Uh, communities also are helping on which uh, things can help us to identify these bots in each scenario. Okay. Um, if we look at the activity that uh, those accounts are producing, we can have a look at things like the frequency of the contributions, the quantity, and also the morphology in the sense of, uh, for instance, in, in commits could be how many files uh, are you modifying with each commit, how many lines have you modified, um, etc. Where did you make the change and how many repositories? So you can, you can have a look at different things. Also, um, we are having a look, I mean, this is based also, of course, on previous research work. Um, you can see work that has been done on looking at similarity and syntactic uh, richness from text. So it depends if you can analyze the commit messages, you can analyze the text of the issues or pull request, you can analyze the comments, uh, etc. Okay, um, this is a, a fairly Difficult problem. Um, the, the main hip hypothesis is um, bots usually uh, produce similar text or they talk similarly, and humans uh, are producing more vi variety. They have more richness in their syntax when they, when they talk and when they produce text. So the main challenge is how to get a metric of that and how to compare that with the whole set of contributors. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's it from, from my side. Um, I invite you to have a look at Remote Lab project. Uh, it's the, the tool that uh, has been used for analyzing these projects and the tool that Wikimedia is using to track their projects. I have some pointers. To, this is the, the first one is the, uh, the link to the Wikimedia tech dashboard okay and you have in wikimedia commons i can point you directly to i can send you the slides afterwards they have amazing documentation on uh, their instance on um, these automatic accounts and so on uh, yeah and that's it from my side so thank you so much thanks Miguel. It's really great to know how we can distinguish humans between bots. <laughs> so, uh, are there any questions for Miguel about this analysis tool? Uh, I also don't have any questions online. Yeah. Hi, thank you for the talk. So, sorry, I had to ask this, but have you seen any any kind of trends with the kind of recent AI uh, developments in maybe new kind of bots that may be helping developers um, in, in the future? Yeah, well, this is difficult for many, many different reasons. First is privacy concerns, because in this case, Wikimedia is taking care of this analysis and they know, I mean, you have to, the, the difficult part is to produce um, a data set that is properly labeled so you can learn from it, right? So um, probably if you ask, I mean, we, we, I, I tried personally to ask one of these models to, to see if it, it can be uh, able to, to distinguish between things, but yeah, it would be great to have a look at it. Uh, I don't know how, how it would help in this case. The idea for this last part is to be integrated with Remote Lab uh, platform. So it's true that we are limited in the sense of we are following a specific data model. So maybe these AI models will give you a general response or general data from taken from the APIs, 
But the idea is to enhance this information with the profile, the unified profiles we have in the identities database. So I don't know how, how well it will work with particular Grimoire Lab data model, but for sure it would, yeah, it's, a great, it's a good idea to, to try that. I don't know if that solves the question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you for a very great talk. Uh, in another part of the Wikimedia universe, in Wikidata, we also see this cyborg-like <laughs> behavior, like yeah. where power users are using semi-automated and automated tools, but not really classified as the bots. Yeah. Do you think a more fine-grade model of different kind of contributors would be useful? Like, I, I think of them like power yeah. users because they know how to use some certain kind of tooling. Yeah. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, this is, uh, of course, this is making the, the process even more difficult because it's not a binary classification problem. It's a multi-class uh, thing. So you don't get only to classify cyborg users, but also you can classify different types of bots. And this is also interesting because you can have bots that make periodic contributions, bots uh, that contribute because they react to a certain event. And this can also be beneficial. So the, the, I mean, the, the idea of exploring more into that way, I think, I mean, if you, have to, if you need to classify those cyber accounts and so on, you, you will need to get into the multi-class uh, problem. I, but it's true that this increases the complexity very, very much. So yeah, but it's something we need to, uh, it's something that we need to keep exploring. We didn't try how this is behaving, even mixing up different sources or mixing different communities. So also, yeah, the, 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 the big question here will be how general would be this, this model, right? And maybe you need to, to build a model for each community with uh, establishing certain parameters, certain configuration parameters that help you adjust some basic tuning. And also, another approach could be to use, um, I think it's, uh, how, I, I, don't know, I don't remember the name, but it's um, a technique for machine learning that is including each new piece of information, it fits the model, and the model gets updated with that. So the more information you get, the, the, the better the model is. You know? uh, but we haven't found any implementation to to, to, to go with that. But I think that would be perfect for this kind of data because we have this data that comes, uh, you know, the contributions are changing, so behavior also uh, can change. So I think this kind of learning models, accumulative, cumulative models, could be really beneficial to, to, to have a look at this. So, yeah. Uh, thanks for the great talk. <coughs> Thank you. It's really interesting. Uh, one question, probably an easy to answer and really technical. Um, we do not only have to map contributions to contributors, and, if, and for, because for transfer pricing reasons, if you want to do that, you also have to map it to legal entities, oh. basically to the affiliation of the contributor. Yeah. The question is, does uh, the sorting hat um, algorithm that you use track that over time? So can I say, where was this contributor affiliated at a certain point in time? So I can, you can do that? Yeah. So that when, you, when, you, uh, when you add this information to the profile of the organizations with a starting date and an ending date, um, this enriched data gets updated with that information. So its, its profile gets labeled. So the contributions made in that period gets labeled for that organization, right? Um, it could happen that a profile can have, I mean, you, you can be enrolled in many organizations at the same time, but this is another problem. <laughs> but yes, uh, this information is taken into account and also bots can be affiliated <laughs> because maybe with the company uh, that, uh, the company which produced them, basically. But yes, all the contributions get labeled uh, with this date, of course. Uh, we, Sorting Hat, what it's doing is trying to infer the organization a profile uh, is enrolled to, looking at some heuristics like uh, the email domain. Okay, so I see an wikimedia.org uh, email. I think, okay, this, I, it infers like, okay, this person works for Wikimedia, but um, we need a person that says this person started working for Wikimedia in this date, and 
ended the, this date and then changed the company and so on. But then afterwards, all the contributions get, uh, get updated. So, yeah. Anybody else? Thank you, Miguel. Thank you so much. <laughs>